Hi, Beth Pratt here with the Save LA Cougars campaign, and I'm coming to you from the top of the Wallace Annenberg Wildlife Crossing. To date, we've been watching the structure take form, 26 million pounds of concrete. But this is the first nature, the soul of the project, to go on top of this. But to create this native habitat, it took a lot of work over a lot of years, and that's where the incredible folks at our native plant nursery come in. Everything from gathering over a million hyperlocal seeds, to the mushrooms, to making sure the soil was prepared. So you're gonna meet in this video the awesome team and partners that made this native plant nursery happen, and that are gonna ensure that this habitat welcomes everything from mountain lions to monarch butterflies. It's not enough to just pick a list of species and just say, here's some painterly things that we're gonna do, we're just gonna sprinkle them everywhere. For this, we wanted to be much more specific, much more cognizant of the reciprocity that exists between that plant community and the soil biology that's there. And how do these plants relate to one another in their, their natural environment? We then had to get to that level of what can we actually grow? Are these plants that we can actually propagate? I made a trip out to the Rancho Sierra Vista nursery that is run by Antonio Sanchez. And while we were walking around at the nursery, he showed me a flat of plants that was from seed that was collected there close to the nursery. And another flat of the same exact plant was seed that was collected from Chesborough Canyon. We had had a, a bit of frost that night and one of those flats was absolutely decimated by that frost. The other one, you could tell that the plants were kind of burnt, but it was 10 o'clock. They were already kind of coming back that next day and they were kind of springing anew. Because of that degree of genetic variability within the same species of plant, if we're going to be successful in creating a tapestry in this new project that is truly of that location and that's really going to succeed and be resilient, we needed to be more specific about what it was we were growing in and all the way down to that genetic level. I thought it was a massive ask. I was really nervous going into that conversation with the project partnership team and asking them to commit to building a nursery for the project. And I was surprised that everyone kind of universally agreed that it was a good strategy and that there was a way to do that. And we started to look at the potential locations for the project nursery. This site near the Zevieroslavsky Trail came up as a possible option because it's on land that's owned and maintained by the Mountains Recreation and Conservation Authority. This property has long been sought by environmentalists. Obviously it's a great piece of our inner mountain wildlife corridor puzzle. And when uh, Robert Rock and Beth Pratt were looking for a place to basically start growing plants to go on the Annenberg Wildlife Crossing, I said, well, we have a parcel that has water and is accessible, and hence agreed to use the site for the nursery. And at the same time, as we're having all these conversations about how to construct the nursery, I was working directly with, with Joey on hiring a nursery manager. So we were asking for a really unique skill set and for someone who was able to conceptualize this with us and move it forward with us. And we interviewed Catherine, we interviewed a few more people. There was this spirit and that zeal in that initial interview with her that showed that she really truly was the person for the project. I was hired back in 2022 to develop a brand new nursery here um, on a mustard infested hillside and working with helpers and volunteers to develop the nursery infrastructure but then also doing seed scouting throughout all of the Santa Monica mountains to hunt for the species that we were going to be planting on the crossing. So taking GPS coordinates of, of populations that I found and doing lots and lots of hiking, lots and lots of seed collections throughout the hot summer months. The plant list, I went through a number of of iterations where the design team got feedback from all the various project partners, including the National Park Service, MRCA, etc. So Caltrans, they all got to weigh in on the plant palette. Part of the, the selection process was limited by the soil depth that's going to be on the crossing. We couldn't have really big, deep-rooted trees um, necessarily when there's a shallow soil depth. So seed scouting is going out into natural lands and you're identifying populations of plants that you want to be able to return turn to when they set seeds. So I literally had months to myself to work to get exactly what was needed done for this particular project. And so to be able to just be roaming the Santa Monica mountains looking for seeds in that sacred 
solitude was such a blessing. It was such a blessing to be part of this particular team and group. And any of the work that I do, I feel like I want to be there as long as I'm needed. And I felt that after one year, things were functional enough to start sowing seeds. And that's when I got my first staff member. Depending on the season, we go out, we seed collect, we have to clean our seed. If we are going to work with that seed, typically we have to store it for a certain amount of time. And then we start initiating propagation. So preparing our soil, mixing our fertilizer and everything that needs to be mixed, putting it within pots, and then of course adding our native plant seeds. And then from that point forward, we just take care of them. So I'm here every day, we water our plants, we pay attention if there's anything going on with them that we need to be concerned with, with possibility of any pathogens coming about them or them being too dry or too wet for that matter. Just an everyday checkup, basically. I think what's pretty unique is how hyper-local the whole project is. So we mainly have been focusing within a five to seven mile radius of the actual crossing site. So we've been seed collecting in that area. We've been collecting mushrooms in that area. The soils from within that area also that's gonna go on the crossing. We do know where our seeds came from. We do know if that particular mother plant was sick or not sick, if there was an abundance or we were taking it from one particular plant relative. We do know like the water source, the livelihood of growing those seeds. Every time we have gone out and done any type of seed collection, whether it be mushrooms or for seeds, we never took before we give. And again, with myself, as well as my other co-manager being Native Indigenous background, that's very, very important for us. Having this relationship, as well as continuously keeping that relationship with our plant relatives, even in our line of work, means a great honor to us. We don't walk into a store and just take everything we want and walk out. We have to pay for it, and it just so happens to be that we pay for it in the form of money. So we pay for something that has sentiment or has meaning to us and so for us it's a form of offering. For my particular offering it tends to be like native tobacco, possibly mixed in with a little bit of sagebrush, sometimes white sage, sometimes pieces of my hair from when I do cut off my ends during our full moons might be mixed in there. So still it's a form of me being re turn back to Mother Earth. So then every time we do go out, we give just a pinch of offering before we take anything. And that's kind of our way of asking our plant relatives and help them to establish their best life as they continue their purpose. In addition to collecting hyperlocal seeds for all the species of plants, we also got to collect mushrooms. And mushrooms are basically the fruit of a fungus, and the spores are like the seeds. We collected the mushrooms for very specific mycorrhizal fungi, which have a mutualistic beneficial association with many of our native plants. So some of them are for oak trees, and some are for the other perennials and shrubs, which are gonna be planted on the crossing. The idea is that we would be inoculating the plants in this nursery prior to sending them out onto the crossing so that they basically come already partnered with their beneficial fungi underground. So that's something that is not done currently in any other landscape uh, project in Southern California that I know of. And it was something that was really, really exciting to be able to work with a mycologist, an expert at identifying the right species and then experimenting with different ways to inoculate the, the plant material. About 90% of the plant species in the world depend on this type of fungi to live. For this project, we developed a concept of selecting native mycorrhizal fungi from the area that is already adapted to these conditions, similar to what they're going to be living in the wildlife crossing. And so basically the fungi attaches and the body of the fungus goes outside. This root, for example, if this is one millimeter, you can have a thousand fungal filaments that goes beyond so basically it's like an, like an extension arm. So these filaments can actually uptake the nutrients and bring them to the root. The fungus produces enzymes in the soil to break down the minerals so they can actually be absorbed. The plant gives sugars. So it's the association, symbiotic, mutualistic association between the fungus and the plant roots because the fungus cannot produce sugars like the plants do through photosynthesis. And those sugars are the ones that everybody in the food chain wants. 
We developed these planters, these boxes, to propagate this mycorrhizal fungi. They are going to be used to inoculate the 50,000 or so individuals here to give them the tools to survive when they go transplanted on the crossing. I monitor those boxes by sampling roots every so often and check if the fungi are colonizing the roots. I take the samples, I clear the roots and stain them, look it on the microscope, and I see the colonization of the root system. So we have evidence that the inoculation of Paramount Ranch soil works with the native species. The National Park Service has a location at Paramount Ranch where soils were dumped decades ago, before that area belonged to the National Park Service. So once the National Park Service took over that area and began managing it, they decided that they wanted to do something about fixing those soils. We've developed a seed farm in that location and we planted native plants over those damaged soils. This is a great way to remediate the soils is by planting native plants in that location. It brings in healthy microbes, it brings in healthy fungus, and it creates a healthy soil community for the plants. But then additionally, the soils will be used from that location and placed in the wildlife crossing to create a healthy soil community for the crossing itself. SAMO Fund is the official partner with the National Park Service here in the beautiful Santa Monica Mountains. And we provide uh, support for the projects and programs that are happening in these mountains. We look for opportunities to be able to fund the collars that the cougars wear, for example. And that allows the researchers from the National Park Service to be able to gather their data and learn more about how they're surviving here. In a world that we don't get to see um, enough examples of hope, the wildlife crossing and the native plant nursery and the respect that we show to these animals is something that brings hope for all of us. We're ensuring that the plants and that whole ecosystem is getting a much better start at becoming really, really robust and resilient and able to withstand stressors and is gonna be just a lot more fit for you know, challenging drought prone environment that we live in. How do we create a soil environment that has that degree of reciprocity with the things that are growing above the surface and having that balance between the root system and the, the canopy of a tree? Well, the first step that we do, and this is something I always like to do and Rob facilitated, is come out early in the project and to assess site conditions. And not only the condition of the site that we're working on, but of the environment, all the areas all around it too. because. In the environment, everything's affected by everything around it. We can start looking at the various properties that we need to restore. What did that soil look like? How can we rebuild it to be as close to nature as possible? Balance the chemistry with the physics, balance the chemistry and the physics with the biology, put it in the right spot and the right place, how water will run to it. And then as I tell people too, to make sure that the soil has an opportunity to breathe, to drink, to consume, but also produce. It's a living thing, it's a living entity. If we have the right microorganisms in the soil, they've got to have that oxygen. So it's breathing back and forth. The soil will build so that it'll form pores. And those pores allow more oxygen to come in. And then it'll also allow water to come in. And that's where the soil drinks. It brings in the water. The water brings in more nutrients because the atmosphere itself, 72% nitrogen. So when it rains, it brings in the nitrogen needed by plants. So the whole system is a continuum. And that's what we're trying to restore. By adding compost to the soil, we're actually helping to open up those pores and allow the soil to drink, to breathe, allow roots to grow. We're kind of giving it a little bit of a head start to open it up to function and to make good things happen. Yeah, so a big part of the nursery is that we're not using any artificial fertilizers. We pretty much have been doing a compost extract. So making that in a big barrel of water, mixing compost that's derived from only plant materials so we don't have any animal byproducts in there like manure, and pumping it out and watering the plants with that. We do that about every two to three months for the past year, two years, and the plants are really healthy. They haven't gone any other fertilizer besides that. We're feeding the soil so that plant material will have less chance of stress, less chance of disease. So what we need to do is to bring in a diversity of microbes to that soil and drench that soil. And the plant then will dictate what microbes it needs to grow. Because what you're trying to do is get to a point, you, you look up here, everything grows, there's no irrigation. 
but there's a system in place that allows that plant material to flourish and that balance is what we're trying to achieve in the cross. We're trying to, like I said, mimic a natural landscape. And so when you're working with something like this where we're, we're designing this from that living surface down as opposed to starting with that structure and then building up, it requires this different level of mental calibration where not only do we have to zoom into the microscopic level and have these conversations about soil bacteria and fungi and the hyphae literally infecting and penetrating the, the cell wall of a root fiber on a, on a plant, and then zoom all the way back out and realize that a drop of water that falls in this site eventually makes its way into the ocean at the Malibu Lagoon. And looking at this at a regional scale and realizing that this is one crossing of what need to be many to restitch these natural areas. Before this was here, it just looked like the hillside that's right next to it, which is just full of mustard. But since being here, we get a lot of pollinators, we get a lot of native birds, cotton rabbits, rattlesnakes, gopher snakes. There's a tree behind us. There's a valley oak and there's a red-tailed hawk nest up there. For the past like two years that I've been here, I've been watching that nest and I've seen little baby hawks in there too, so that was pretty cool. A lot of coyotes up on the hill too. Sometimes I hear them howl. These plants are already bringing the life here at the nursery. Once they go on the crossing, they're gonna do the same thing, but just on a bigger scale. When you're working with the natural environment, you also have to accept that you're designing for a moment in time, but you have to have a vision that's over a hundred years into the future. I want my son to grow up in a world where he has all these pieces of the natural environment that, that we all have. And the only way for us to be able to have that happen is for us to sustain what we have and find opportunities to elevate the way that we protect these spaces that are so precious and near and dear to us. We need these healthy natural areas because our health as human beings is very strongly tied to the health of our natural areas. By bringing in native plants that are local to the area, they provide wildfire resistance and resilience. They respond to climate change. They pull carbon out of the atmosphere. And they're really the best solution for responding to these big human impacts that we're facing. We frequently don't realize how much we've fragmented and, and harmed our environments. It's very, very fun to connect nature to nature and to connect people to nature and remember that we're part of it. We never should have left. When I'm coming to the project site and I'm driving north on the 101, there's that moment where you come under the bridge at Lost Hills and then you come over that crest and I look down at the crossing. I see the ribbons of green that are gonna cascade across that. I see the mountain being put back. I see this, this connection that's been severed for over a century kind of coming back and becoming this, this new thing. We have 5,000 plants or so for stage one, but oh, over 30,000 for stage two. So yes, I'm excited to get it going because it'll be a great initiative and a great drive for us. It shows that all the work they did was worth it and that they could do it again. It makes me really happy because I've been here when there was no plans. We were still building tables. We first started growing stuff in flats and Seeing the plants starting off super small and what they are now is pretty amazing. It's going to be pretty sad to see them go. All of these beautiful plant relatives that you see will be leaving us to go and live their purpose on our beautiful crossing. It's definitely a bittersweet, but in reality, that's the purpose of them, right? Is to go out into the world and thrive and to live their best lives and then to continue to build that relationship with all our animal relatives and help them to thrive. And it's just the circle of life and it's the way that things are supposed to be, which keeps the balance of life.